Mr. Robert E. McLean has been Executive Director of the Mailers Council since 1996. From 1998 to 1996, Mr. McLean represented the National Association of Postal Supervisors on Capitol Hill. Additionally, he has been an adjunct professor at George Mason University. Uh, Mr. Jim O'Brien is the chairman of the Association for Postal Commerce, also called Postcom. He is also the vice president of distribution and postal affairs for Time Incorporated. Prior to joining Time Incorporated in 1979, excuse me, 1978, he has held positions with R.R. Donnelly, United States Postal Ser excuse me, United Parcel Service, and the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Conway, you may begin. You have five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Lynch. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify here on behalf of the Alliance of Nonprofit Mailers. Uh, the Alliance is a coalition of nonprofit organizations dedicated to the preservation of affordable postage rates and dependable mail service. Established in 1980, the Alliance includes over 300 nonprofit organizations and commercial service providers with an interest in nonprofit mailing issues. Our members include many of the nation's best known charitable, religious, educational, scientific, and other nonprofit organizations. These members rely heavily on nonprofit standard mail and nonprofit periodicals mail to generate necessary support from and communicate with existing and potential members, beneficiaries, and other stakeholders. The causes of the Postal Service crisis are well known. The decline in mail volume caused by the current economic downturn has merely accelerated the long-term decline in hard copy correspondence and the diversion of bill payments and other transactions to electric, electronic media. When the economy stabilizes, some mail volume will return to the system, but not enough to fund the Postal Service network cost structure. The result is that even co aggressive cost-cutting efforts have not enabled the Postal Service to shrink its costs fast enough to keep pace with the declining mail volume. The Postal Service's stakeholders have proposed a number of solutions to these problems, and perhaps the most urgently, urgently, urgently needed is the short-run remedy is passage of H.R. 22. Other worthwhile short-term and medium-term remedies include, first, increasing work sharing to allow mailers and third-party vendors to perform functions when they can do so at a lower cost. Two, expanding the use of automation when this is cost effective. And three, more innovative pricing such as the current summer sale discount proposal. And Mr. Chairman, it's time to seriously consider the end of Saturday mail delivery. Should you decide such a move is necessary, nonprofit mailers will work with you to ensure its successful adoption. One option that would be devastatingly counterproductive would be an emergency rate increase. As the Postal Service has recognized, this strategy would accelerate the flight of mail volume from the Postal Service and hurt society as a whole. It certainly would hurt the beneficiaries of nonprofit organizations. The current economic crisis has forced layoffs and program cuts throughout the nonprofit community. Revenues have dried up just when society needs most urgently the good work of nonprofit organizations. Further postal rate increases would only mean further reductions in mission-related programs and greater burdens on national, state, and local governments. None of the remedies discussed above, however, is likely to see, succeed without a thorough pruning of the Postal Service's massive cost structure. The Postal Service's infrastructure and capacity, built over many years with the assumption of ever-increasing mail volume, far exceed the needs of today's postal customers. Comprehensive streamlining of this excess capacity is desperately needed. Unless this painful course is taken, the remedies suggested above will only offer a brief detour from the road to insolvency. The United States Postal Service is the greatest postal system in the world. It handles over 40 percent of the world's mail and maintains a delivery network that is second to none. It has been the Cadillac of postal systems for many years, but unfortunately, the nation's needs have changed. Instead of the big V8, the nation now needs a mid-size model with greater efficiency. If it cannot attain such an affordable size, the Postal Service could end up like some of the automakers in Detroit. We don't want that to happen, and we hope that necessary change comes quickly for an organization that means so much to American society. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McLean for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate this opportunity to present the views of the Mailers Council. 
a coalition of mailers and mailing associations. My members collectively represent 70% of all mail in the United States. And we are especially appreciative of you focusing on the post services financial problems, which are a great concern to our members who rely on a, an affordable, consistent, and high quality postal system. Right now, the postal services operations are operating quite well. Uh, but the word crisis seems very appropriate here. It's often overused at hearings like this, but when the Postal Service says that it may not be able to pay its employees, its retirees, or its bills on October 1st, the word crisis seems very appropriate. We think there are two reasons why the Postal Service's short-term problems exist uh, in terms of their finances. One is the recession, which is responsible for the decline of billions of pieces of mail. Uh, the other is the aggressive schedule that the Postal Service has had to hew to under the PAEA concerning the pre-funding of retiree health care costs. And therefore, we greatly appreciate the support that you and this subcommittee will offer to uh, ensure the passage of H.R. 22. Uh, that is a, an important uh, first step to offering the Postal Service some short-term relief. But clearly, the system needs uh, more long-term measures. Uh, mailers uh, firmly understand this, uh, agree with the need to it. Uh, but have had some difficulty coming to uh, uh, agreement on what terms should be appropriate. And when it comes to five-day delivery, my members are open to this possibility, recognizing that it will create problems for many of them. We've opposed it officially at this point because the Postal Service has yet to offer the level of detail that we would like. Um, which day of the week will it be? Uh, will this be only uh, a, a summer program as initially proposed, or will this be permanent? Uh, will it be offered as a pilot program first, and how much will mailers be involved in any establishment of a pilot program? All uh, questions to which we would like to have answers quickly so that we can determine whether or not this is an idea we can fully support. Um, there are other ways that, that the Postal Service can reduce its expenses, and you've asked us to focus on one, which is right-sizing the delivery network. It's clear to us that the Postal Service has excess capacity in the system. It simply does not need the number of mail processing facilities that it has, nor can it afford the size of the network that it has today, given the amount of mail volume that has left the system. Um, one of the measures that we hope the Postal Service will avoid, however, is something that Mr. Conway mentioned, and that is an exigent rate case. Uh, any additional increase in postage rates at this point would be incredibly counterproductive and would in discourage the return of mail volume to the system, which we hope will occur as the economic situation in this country rebounds. Um, Congress has given the Postal Service a mandate to deliver excellent service to every American in every state without government financial support, which it has done for the past several decades. Right now, uh, my members report that service is very good and the Postal Service is meeting its delivery standards, which we believe is a tribute to both good management and the support of the postal employees. We want quality service to continue, but that cannot happen unless Congress, the Postal Service, and the mailing industry all recognize that as early as September 30th, the agency may be unable to meet its financial obligations. So we ask for your help in avoiding that so that the Postal Service does not become a burden on taxpayers. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for this opportunity to testify. I would gladly answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Mr. O'Brien, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Postcom would like to thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on the Postal Service's cost-cutting efforts. All Postcom member companies need a healthy Postal Service to ensure the viability of our businesses. In 2008, the Postal Service delivered 202 billion pieces of mail, approximately the same volume that was delivered in 1999. However, in 2008, the Postal Service delivered to 15 million more delivery points than it did in 1999. These sobering facts indicate that the Postal Service cannot remain financially self-sustaining for much longer under its current model unless it is given the freedom to make changes in other areas. The Postal Service is much too important to the economy and to the American public to be allowed to atrophy and fail. Saving the Postal Service will require the commitment of USPS management, the postal unions, the mailing industry, the Postal Regulatory Commission, and Congress. Some of the choices facing us will not be without pain. We're all going to have to make some sacrifices. To that end, Postcom has several recommendations beginning with network adjustments. Mailers feel very strongly that the Postal Service must adjust its network to match today's volume and service requirements. Such a network adjustment could have a negative impact on service. Postcom members are willing to accept service adjustments if the net result is an overall reduction in USPS costs and increased consistency. As long as service remains predictable and reliable, mailers can adjust their printing and mailing schedules to compensate for any network changes. 
Given the Postal Service's perilous financial condition, we hope that the Postal Service will not be thwarted in its efforts to streamline the network and reduce costs. The frequency of mail delivery is another issue where the mailing industry is willing to put skin in the game. Postcom understands that the Postal Service does not have many opportunities that can result in a savings of $3.5 billion. And I know you think that that number is uh, a little bit fuzzy, and, and, and we would agree. Uh, we also accept the fact that volume is declining and may never return to prior levels. Many Postcom mailers have business plans that depend on six-day delivery. However, given the dire straits that the Postal Service is now in, Postcom is willing to work with the Postal Service on developing a delivery day solution. The end result will damage the mailers' businesses, but may be required to ensure the survival of the Postal Service. We also realize that reducing delivery by one day per week is a decision that cannot be made by the mailing industry or the Postal Service, but requires the approval of Congress. We urge you to give the, the need for this measure serious consideration. Work sharing is another very important tool for making appropriate adjustments to the scope and scale of the Postal Service's mail processing system. This process is based upon the concept of operating at the lowest combined cost between the mailer and the Postal Service. In work sharing, rates are set at a level that reflects improved postal efficiencies and marketplace realities. This type of sensible business-like behavior is needed now more than ever, and Postcom strongly recommends the continuation and expansion of work sharing incentives. The Post Service is also pursuing an automation strategy to improve the processing of flat-shaped mail. Postcom applauds these efforts so long as they are aimed at achieving the lowest combined costs across the entire mail supply chain and are not merely shifting costs upstream to mailers and or, or mail service providers. On May 7, 2009, the Postal Regulatory Commission granted the Postal Service permission to sell unutilized capacity on its trucks. The Commission has also opened a docket on summer sale prices that are designed to generate more mail volume during the USPS's lowest volume period. Postcom supports both these concepts and notes that these creative ideas represent fresh thinking that has long been absent in the Postal Service's revenue generation efforts. The Postal Service must not be afraid to fail in these tests, and the Postal Regulatory Commission, Congress, and the mailing industry must provide the latitude that allows either success or failure. Postcom would be remiss if we did not mention the need for a restructuring of retiree health care funding. Postcom appreciates the effort, efforts of Congressman John McHugh and uh, the 309 co-sponsors of H.R. 22. Yeah. It is critical that this legislation gets signed into law prior to September 30, 2009, and we urge Congress to take immediate action. In summary, Postcom members depend on a reliable and affordable postal service. Given the perilous state of USPS finances, neither Congress, the Postal Service, the Postal Unions, nor mailers can avoid these issues any longer. Substantive changes must happen very quickly, or the Postal Service, as we know it, may not survive. Thank you. Thank you. Earlier today, uh, we had an opportunity to hear from uh, the Postal Service and also uh, the Postal Regulatory Commission. And we had uh, a couple of the unions in, the American Postal Workers Union and uh, the mail handlers. And also, we had uh, Mr. Goff testify from the Postal Supervisors. You're the first today who will actually testify as customers of, of the Postal Service. And, I, and I'd like you to, I know you were all present uh, during the previous testimony, and you've handled this issue for quite a while. Let, let me ask you to, to provide the committee with testimony regarding what you think the priorities should be. We're looking at, uh, obviously, reducing costs uh, to the Postal Service and trying to restructure the Postal Service so that its viability is assured. Uh, so if you have any thoughts on the, the order of priority where you think we should look for those savings, um, obviously in a way that minimizes its impact on, on your constituency businesses, uh, but also if you think there are services that could be offered that could generate revenues that might alleviate uh, some of the pressure we're feeling right now uh, from a decrease in, in uh, volume. Uh, I'd just like to hear your, your thoughts on where do you think Congress should look uh, as areas of priority in, in trying to accomplish our goal here, which is obviously to save the Postal Service. Mr. Conway. Thank you. Um, 
In terms of the, uh, the cost structure and the reduction of, of, of the costs, um, as I said in my written statement, the, uh, uh, the, the infrastructure of the Postal Service was built for um, a, a massive mail volume just no longer exists. Uh, at its peak in 2006, the Postal's handled 213 billion pieces of mail. Um, few doubt the total volume will ever uh, top two, 200 billion again. Um, the excess capacity of the network has been built over many, many years. And uh, uh, if you recall, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, prior to 1970, the Postal Service uh, was under the control of the United States Congress. And the result is that um, during those years, um, a lot of decisions about where to place facilities and, uh, and so on were made by the Congress. And uh, as a result, you look at the total picture of the Postal Service imprint, uh, and you can see the political influence on the system. Not to say that's necessarily bad, but you can see it. Um, and it also, I think, reflects the importance of the post office and the postal system to America and to the Congress. Um, I think going forward, the need to, 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 for, the, for people like ourselves and the people with a stake in the postal system to help inform the American public and the, uh, and the United States Congress about this severe problem to get an understanding and get a, perhaps a little more flexibility that's needed to make these changes, I think, would be extremely helpful. Uh, as far as new products and services, um, I, again, the summer sale, most in the mailing community have applauded this, this initiative. I think most have felt it's long overdue. Uh, but it's just the start. And uh, I think there needs to be a whole lot more creativity within the Postal Service. Um, and it, it can't come fast enough. And I also think the Congress might want to consider uh, the, the absolute restrictions that now exist on what the Postal Service can do. Um, as a necessary government function, the Postal Service is everywhere in this country. It has a delivery network that is superb. Um, I think the Congress might want to consider what kinds of things the Postal Service is well suited for that it could provide the American people that perhaps are not, is not being provided by uh, the private sector or perhaps could be done more efficiently by the Postal Service than is being done now by other government agencies. Thank you. Mr. McLean. I'd like to make three points, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, first of all, in terms of long-term solutions, assuming that H.R. 22 is approved, and that's a, a large assumption at this point, I recognize. But long-term, everything has to be on the table from operations to compensation. Mailers recognize that, and we're willing to make concessions um, that would ensure the, the future vitality of the Postal Service. Um, once the recession begins to, to uh, subside and the economy rebounds, uh, issues such as work sharing will become much more important. It's very important that we try to find more ways to bring more mail into the system. The Postal Service has fixed costs that are going to require to spend a certain amount of money making a delivery to your home, whether they deliver one piece of mail or ten. Work sharing can ensure that more mail is delivered to every household. That will help reduce the uh, cost of delivering per piece, and that will help ensure that the Postal Service can return uh, to a more positive financial situation. And third, I would suggest that we find ways of making postal products more available to folks. Um, in Mr. Galligan's testimony, he noted the fact that you can now buy postage stamps in thousands of supermarkets around the country. Stamps are one thing, postal products are another. And if you go into most post offices today, there's no longer a vending machine where you can buy uh, more than just stamps or more than just a first-class postage stamp. Uh, technology to put into kiosks that can be put into locations and not just into post offices. I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could go to the grocery store and there would be a kiosk where you could mail a package, weigh it, get the postage that you need, and wouldn't involve the salary of a single postal employee. Uh, greater use of technology and other ideas that would help uh, make it more accessible to, to get to the Postal Service, reducing lines on Saturday, which are very long at the post office where I live in Arlington, Virginia, would be a positive way of ensuring that people continue to use the post office and perhaps of increasing revenue in ways that are unavailable today. Thank you. Mr. O'Brien. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think if you're looking for a, uh, for a game plan for moving forward, um, I'd like to suggest uh, first 
considering the short-term relief on uh, HR 22 and whether you know the the scope of that uh, is two years or eight years or whatever Congress elects to uh, to pursue. I mean that that's really up to to you and and scoring here. But um, we don't want we as mailers don't want to see the Postal Service default on its payment to Treasury, and we're very concerned about what happens if they. Um, if they make a, a withdrawal of uh, of three billion dollars in uh, in September 30th on September 30th, and then another three billion on October 1st, where is that going to put us mid 2010? We're in a world of hurt. So um, so I, I think we ought to put that issue aside and try and resolve that as as step number one. Uh, step number two, uh, networks. Uh, the the postal service. We should give them the flexibility to modify their networks right now. Let them run with that. I'll give you an example of what happened when, when, they, when they messed it up. Um, they pursued a, a closing of a facility out in, uh, in Long Beach, California. And, um, and that facility went awry. It just, the service fell off the table. And mailers screamed. And we went to the Postal Regulatory Commission. We went to the Postal Service. Um, this, this system will self-monitor. We have po post the Postal Regulatory Commission is watching service like a hawk right now. So I don't think we need to worry too much about them, them going down the wrong path if we give them the flexibility to, to adjust their network. So I would say that, that should be the second step. The third step is, uh, as you pointed out earlier, five-day week delivery. And five-day week delivery um, is, is a big ticket item for the Postal Service. They can save a lot of money, but um, you know, it's going to affect people's businesses. And I'll give you an example. Our business, Time Magazine, um, gets affected more than anybody else. Um, uh, we deliver 77% of Time Magazine on Saturday today. So I've met with our I'm sorry, say that last part again. I'm sorry. Seven percent of Time magazine gets delivered on Saturday. Really? Yeah. We built our whole our whole system or our whole business around getting magazines to people so that they have them on the weekends because they sit on nightstand Monday through Friday and then on the weekend is when you have the time to read the magazines. So we've kind of built our business that way. We right. actually changed the schedule for Time magazine a number of years ago. And and so um, so we're going to get hurt worse than anybody, to be honest with you, with the loss of Saturday delivery. But I think those are the kind of sacrifices that we're all going to have to make. We ask the unions to make sacrifices. You know, we're asking you to swallow a bitter pill here, to you know, with your constituencies to say, you know, we're we're allowing facilities to close. We're allowing Saturday delivery to go away. Um, we also look look around the world, and we also recognize it's not the end of the world. Canada Post does five day a week delivery. I believe we're the only postal service in the world that does six day a week delivery. So, um, so, so we may not be that different from everybody else in the future. Um, you know, we still do business in Canada with five day a week delivery. It, you know, people adjust, consumers adjust. Um, so, so I think we can get there. But I think, as you pointed out earlier. Uh, we need to understand the numbers. We need to understand the impact. And, and once we have that information, I think mailers and the Postal Service and the American public will, will get behind that. Um, I also think, you know, you, you pointed out, you, you know, your family here, um, letter carriers are in, in your family. I think letter carriers will, will appreciate having Saturday and Sunday off in the long term. Um, so, so it's not the end of the world here. Uh, we just have to make sure that we do it right. So if, if I had to prioritize the three, as you asked, uh, the, the issues going forward, relief on the finance, um, uh, mail facility closings, uh, adjusting the network to match the volume, and then finally looking at the delivery days. Thank you. Uh, since you all mentioned the, the issue of five-day five day delivery going to that practice, uh, there, there were some concerns raised at the earlier panels. Uh, again, the, the savings estimates are, are greatly varied. Uh, uh, I think one came, one uh, report came in at 1.9 billion dollars, another one at 3.4 or something like that. So there's a pretty pretty wide variance, and I, I think the committee needs to get uh, a good, accurate uh, picture. As a matter of fact, we may um, may look at at HR 22 if that gets marked up uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, commissioning a study to see what these, you know, obviously in the short term, 
to see what the real savings might be, to get somebody very good and reliable. Not that the others were not, but they're, they're all over the map uh, at what those savings might be. Uh, we also, you know, I, I thought Mr. Hegarty of the Mail Handlers Union uh, raised a great point about the fact that there are 10 federal holidays, uh, the great majority of which end up on a Monday. So if you have no service on Saturday, Sunday, Monday for those seven or eight holidays that end up falling on a Monday, you've got a pretty good block of time there where folks don't get their mail. Uh, that, that's a problem. So we need to figure that out. And I don't know if we actually build a calendar of certain Saturdays that are continue to be uh, delivered. We, we have to look at that more closely. This all just points out to the need for a little deeper thought on this. Uh, some of the, Mr. Conway had the opportunity to, to come into the office yesterday and speak to me about some of the needs that, that uh, you know, he uh, foresaw or that others raised. The issue of perhaps having a, for those who absolutely have to have, you know, delivery on Saturday, and, you know, time may not be in that category, but uh, there may be a priority option mm -hmm. for, for some of those folks. I don't know, hospitals, uh, you know, I'm just trying to think those constituencies that we constituencies that we have not heard from uh, might be offered that option. It would have to be paid for, obviously. Uh, uh, but, but under those terms, we could probably find that acceptable. And uh, let's see. The, the, the other issue that, that was raised is the, the ability to retain business. If you leave that gap, as, as each of you has signified, uh, of now you're going to have a couple of days, Saturday and somebody, some, Saturday and Sunday. Somebody's going to fill that void. It may be UPS, it may be FedEx, but it may cause that further deterioration in uh, postal business, and I'm concerned about that. So I guess that'll all be built into that that number where they tell us what our savings will be, because obviously there'll be some spoilage by losing the business that that uh, might have been done already on Saturday, that, but that will go away if uh, we discontinue this practice. Talk to me about that, specifically about the issue of five-day delivery and uh, what it would mean to some of your constituency businesses. None of the other stuff for now, but just the five-day delivery. Mr. Conway. Yes, sir. Uh, well, nonprofits, um, you know, in this country range from very, very large to very, very small, uh, it's, it's, and, and they're all over the lot. Um, their models in terms of, of why they exist and their, their function uh, vary, um, all certain worthy, worthy ideals, and, and their business models um, are, are, again, they vary greatly uh, throughout the country. Um, that said, there most certainly are many nonprofits that will tell me that Saturday is extremely valuable, perhaps the most valuable day um, uh, of mail delivery for them. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, that may well be the case. Uh, there was a recent um, survey done by the Nonprofit Times, which is one of the leading nonprofit publications in the country, uh, about mail delivery and, and uh, the question posed to nonprofits was, um, if there had to be uh, the reduction of a day, um, which, way, which day would be less impactful on nonprofits? The overwhelming selection by nonprofits in that survey was Saturday. Saturday was the, uh, the least impactful. Uh, the most impactful day, uh, interestingly, uh, that, that folks said we, they couldn't do without was Monday. Um, and uh, that is owing to a lot of things, partially because nonprofit, uh, nonprofits tend to operate like most organizations with a five-day work week. And uh, uh, so if it were, say, Tuesday were deleted, you have your staff is in there on Tuesday, but they have no mail delivery, they have nothing to work, it would create a problem. But Saturday, most, most nonprofits, not all, but most uh, would not necessarily, their business plan now is not modeled there. So again, that survey, which was certainly, it's not the entire nonprofit community, but it was representative, I think, of nonprofits at large that Saturday would be the least harmful to, to our community. 
Mr. McLean. For my members, uh, because of the size and breadth of our organization, I have members for whom Saturday delivery is extremely important, including magazine publishers. I have others for whom Saturday is something that they could live without. So I have members that fit into everything. Some prefer that it would be Monday as the day off. Some would prefer it be in the middle of the week when the Postal Service would not deliver. So uh, I'm not going to be able to offer you consensus on that. For my members, as much as anything, though, what would be important to them is that any change like this, first of all, be uh, one that would reduce the Postal Service's fixed costs. If it does that, it's going to help keep down postage. If it keeps down the price of postage, everybody's going to be in support of it. I think also it's very important how this is done. Um, we have not had detailed discussions with the Postal Service about exactly how they would design such a program. And I don't think the Postal Service has done that because they're looking for a lead from you, Mr. Chairman, in terms of what Congress's uh, approach to this is going to be, because without your support, this discussion doesn't, even, doesn't go anywhere. Um, I think that as long as we are part of the discussion in terms of planning it, as long as there's an opportunity to participate in the design of it, uh, I think a lot of my members would eventually get behind it. But we'd like to know more details. That's only going to happen if we can get a sign from you that this is something that, that you would seriously consider, because um, clearly we have to go after the fixed costs. And when more than 80 percent of your expenses are from labor, and you can eliminate a lot of labor costs by eliminating a day of delivery, it's something we seriously have to consider. Okay. Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, as, as Bob indicated, uh, everyone has a different preferred day to eliminate. Um, and, uh, and within POSTCOM, we have members such as large banks. Bank of America is a member of, of POSTCOM. Um, so, so they would like to keep cash flow moving, right? They don't want to allow uh, any day to, to go by the wayside, and that's understandable. Um, uh, you know, magazine publishers like us, weekly magazine publishers, we don't want Saturday to go away. But I, but I think what we can do is going forward is find solutions to that problem. You know, there, there may be alternatives. Uh, uh, Medco, the, uh, the pharmaceutical company that d distributes drugs, um, Medco is a postcom member. Medco, you know, doesn't want their, their consumers to wait three days to get Medco delivered. Um, so, so I think um, we have to look at alternatives to just being hardcore, there will be no Saturday. I, I think there are alternatives. I mean, if you look at United Parcel Service today, they do offer Saturday delivery at a premium. Or there are there are ways to work around these things. So I don't, I don't think it has to be as, uh, as ice cold as people may think. Yeah, I, I, I get the impression, you know, from, from all the uh, testimony today that need, needs to be much more discussion about Absolutely. this. This needs to be very thoughtful. Uh, and I'm not entirely convinced at this point that the savings are there or that uh, at least the blanket uh, uh, elimination of Saturday delivery would, would produce the desired effect. Uh, let me ask you, for some of this mail volume that we're seeing, a decline in uh, obviously it's as a result of the recession but but if you follow you know first class mail I know you're not this is not necessarily your your uh, forte but uh, we we have seen decline for a number of years and it's a, a, the same trend uh, and that's a big money maker for for the post office uh, what do you see you know, we're, we're trying to match the structure and, and organization of the post office to respond to demand. And what do you see over the next two, three years? Uh, you know, I'm hearing that 2010, it could be just as bad, if not worse, than, as, as 2009, which would be dreadful. Mm -hmm. uh, but but going, going forward, what do you see in terms of uh, the trend for uh, mail volumes and, and how, does, how do we match up with that? Because we've got this crisis we're dealing with now, but I, I see some issues down the road a little bit. Uh, why don't we stop, Mr. O'Brien? Sure. Um, I have to tell you, uh, no one has a crystal ball on this, um, unfortunately. I mean, if you pick up a copy of Time magazine today, I mean, it's pretty thin. You know? yeah. And, that, and, and um, we don't know when our advertising is going to come back. And yeah. no one knows. And, and so uh, what we do have a feeling of is that some of this volume that's gone away, companies are gone. Um, Condé Nast, Nast recently shut down Portfolio magazine. It's gone. Right. And, and so, so we know that's not coming back. Um, will other businesses pop up in the future? Sure. Um, uh, but, but, um, but I think we've got, you know, we, we've got a situation here where, where uh, 
neither the Postal Service nor the mailers know what's going to happen down the road, and I, and I really wish we did. Um, so, so I can't give you a solid answer on, you know, is the volume going to come back? What I can tell you is I, I give a lot of presentations uh, on the Postal Service to, you know, to industry associations and groups and things like that, and I always survey the members of the audience, and I, say, I ask them, how many of you pay your bills electronically? And invariably, nowadays, the number is about 70% of the people in the room say, I pay my bills electronically. And I ask them, how many of you receive your bills electronically? And maybe 10% put their hand up. And I think there's a big difference right now. People still want the hard copy. So I don't think that first class volume is going to go away as fast as yeah. you think. I think the big chunk is gone right now in, in the payment part of it, but I think the outgoing bills is still going, uh, they're, they're still going to stick around for a while. So, um, so I also have to tell you, the Postal Service is really trying to do something about volume. Um, they, last year they hired someone by the name of Bob Bernstock. I don't know if you've met him or, or heard about him, no. but he came from private industry. And, and, and Bernstock used to be the uh, CEO of Scott's miracle Grow. And so he came from private industry. He knows how business operates, and, um, and he's very creative. He, he and his team were the ones that came up with the summer sale. I think there's going to be a lot more creativity down the road uh, with that kind of person on, on board. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. McLean? In terms of the full service's future, I think it's important to remember there's two categories of, of customers in general. There are those who have to use the Postal Service, and there are those who choose to use the Postal Service. The number who have to use the Postal Service is declining, and that may continue to be the case, as documents are now permitted legally to be transmitted by email, by fax, and other means. Um, and as Mr. O'Brien noted, there are an increasing number of people who pay their bills online. Uh, but in terms of the group that choose to use the Postal Service, I, I always like to talk about my brother. My brother ran a restaurant in Memphis, uh, my hometown, for a number of years. My brother does, did not need and could not afford television advertising, radio advertising, internet advertising, because it reached the wrong people, it reached too many people, and it was too expensive. But the Postal Service was a terrific marketing alternative for him because it could be narrowed down not just to the zip code, but to the few blocks around his neighborhood restaurant. It was the perfect marketing tool. For many businesses in this country, the Postal Service is something they choose to use because it offers that affordability, that limited reach, and as long as we can keep postage prices down, as long as we can keep them affordable, along with the cost of printing and the cost of paper, many people are going to continue to use the Postal Service. Um, in the association that I manage, the Mailers Council, we have once again returned to sending invoices for membership by mail. One of the reasons why is because many people look at emails, they don't necessarily read them intently, they don't necessarily act on them. And for a number of businesses, not just my association, mail continues to be the device that ensures that people act the way you want them to. Buying your product, buying your service, voting, whatever it might be, it continues to be an incredibly effective communication tool. If we can keep it affordable, we will keep the mail in there, that will help ensure that there's sufficient volume to keep those fixed costs spread out over enough pieces of mail that the Postal Service can continue to operate. But without keeping postage affordable, and that means reducing the fixed costs, which is operations, the size of the network, and what we pay to employees, the Postal Service will no longer be an effective and affordable communications tool, and it'll go by the wayside. Okay. Mr. Conway. Yes, sir. Um, uh, mail volume, uh, it, it's an interesting phenomenon. It is now obviously in major decline, uh, but the decline of the most crucial part of mail volume, first class mail, started long before this economic downturn. Mm -hmm. First class mail has funded the basic growth of the Postal <laughs> Service infrastructure forever. It makes the most contribution to the overhead costs of the Postal Service, which are extensive. Um, it, it has basically paid the bills for the last couple hundred years. That mail volume, with that mail volume declining, I, it, I don't see it coming back. I think the, the decline that has started gradually in the last five or so years will continue. Some say it will accelerate, some say it may taper off, but I think it will continue. Uh, and that leaves you with how do you grow the necessary volume to make up for that loss? The rule of thumb for many years has been that standard mail, which is the highest growth volume product now in the Postal Service, you need almost three pieces of standard mail 
to make up for the loss of one piece of first class mail. Standard mail is not growing that fast. Um, uh, I doubt it can grow that fast in the future. So there, there lies the financial dilemma. Once the economy does stabilize, mail volume most certainly will come back to a certain degree, but it's the mix of mail volume that is the real critical problem. How do you replace that very lucrative product, um, uh, the, the revenue that has lost there? And I don't know that, that anyone in the postal community has found an answer to that. Unless someone does, um, then you have to deal with, okay, we just can't afford to fund this massive structure anymore as we have, unfortunately. All right. Uh, earlier today, we did hear from uh, the earlier witnesses that uh, there had been a, a freeze on constructing new post offices uh, and a freeze on hiring. So I think they get the message. But for many, many years, as you've stated, uh, we just went on a building spree in this country on post offices to the point where we have 36,000 of them now. Uh, and as uh, Chairman of this committee, it seems like every week I'm naming a new post office. I honestly <laughs> believe we'll run out of names before we run out of post offices. <laughs> but, uh, you know, th this is a paradigm shift here. We're changing the model of this uh, to allow it to survive. I think the flexibility is important here. It's just that uh, uh, the Postal Service is one of those constants in our life that uh, when it changes, as, as, as it looks like it needs to change, uh, it, it upsets a lot of people. So we have to sort of bring people along, let them know what the problem is, and, and let them be reassured that this is, this is to preserve that universal service that they, they enjoy so much. Uh, I'm sure that I did not exhaust uh, all of the important areas of inquiry with my questions. So what I'd like to do is give you each an opportunity, say three minutes. Uh, if there are certain points that you think I've, I've missed or that uh, need to be emphasized, please take that opportunity. Uh, anything that you think may not have been raised at today's hearings, either in your panel or a panel that might have been, uh, a question that might have been properly addressed to one of the other panels, please, uh, you know, feel free to raise it now. In fairness to my colleagues who are in markups in other committees, uh, I'm going to allow them to ask any questions of you in writing and also welcome your responses as well. Uh, Mr. Conway. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to first just thank you for, uh, uh, for taking on this very, very tough task. Um, your, your leadership on, on what is an incredibly difficult political issue um, is, is going to be really needed going forward, and uh, um, I think it's going to be uh, in, incumbent on my organization and everybody with a stake in the Postal Service to support your efforts. Um, I know what you face. I've been around uh, the postal political scene for nearly 40 years, and uh, you're going to hear it from both sides of the aisle. Uh, but you're doing the right thing. Uh, you're taking on this, this issue, I think, in a very fair manner, and, and we will pledge to continue to support you as necessary changes are made. Thank you, Mr. Conway. Mr. McClain. Mr. Chairman. Um, my mother comes from Lucy, Tennessee. I have a sister in Poto, Oklahoma, another sister in Lexington, Virginia, and one in Lewis, Delaware. And there's not a UPS, FedEx, Kinko's, Minuteman copier, or other place where you can ship things. You have to go to the United States Postal Service. And there are members of Congress that represent each one of those communities, and I'm sure they're going to howl when they hear, because I don't think many of them have heard yet, what we're considering at this hearing today. But what they need to understand and what we need your help explaining is that the Postal Service is an essential tool of business, not an optional one. But for those businesses to reach the people who live in those communities in the future, the Postal Service has to be allowed to change. And H.R. 22 is a great first step in that direction, but additional legislation is going to be necessary. So if we're going to keep the Postal Service in these communities where they are the only way of doing hard copy communication, we have to allow the Postal Service to remain affordable, and that's where we need your help, and we appreciate you having this hearing today as a first step in that direction. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Chairman, um, a couple of things that we didn't talk about. Uh, back in 2003, uh, or actually before 2003, a presidential commission was uh, created to study the Postal Service, and uh, in 2003, they, they issued this report. 
enhancing the future, uh, making the tough choices to preserve universal mail service. And, and we haven't really discussed that at all. There, there are a lot of good thoughts in here. I would encourage the staff of this committee to, uh, to review this document and, um, and, and see what they had to say so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I, I, I would like to reiterate both with what uh, Tony and, and Bob had to say um, in that uh, we appreciate your efforts here. Um, I, I'm incredibly impressed with, uh, with the level of engagement of this subcommittee and uh, your knowledge of the issues as well as um, uh, minority uh, leader uh, Chaffetz. Uh, it, it's very impressive. Um, we also want you to know that the Postal Service, it, they're, they're not just a supplier to us. Uh, they're business partners. If they go under, all of our companies are, are gone. You know, and, and we can't afford that to happen. And that's, that's really at the, the crux of the matter here. You know, we've all built our businesses on Postal. And, and you know, as, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, one of the members of, of Postcom is the Alliance of Independent Store Owners and Professionals. Very, very small people, your local hardware store and people like that. And, and they do exactly what Bob said, where they saturate the mail delivery around their stores. And that's how they stay in business. So we all need a healthy postal service, and, uh, and we commend you for, for uh, taking action to help us achieve that. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your attendance here today. Uh, I, I do want to note, I, I misidentified uh, Mr. Goff. Uh, I said he was part of, the, uh, uh, part of NAPS, the National Association of Postal Supervisors. He's actually with NAPUS, which is the National Association of Postmasters of the United States. So uh, my apologies to Mr. Goff. Uh, for that error. Uh, look, thank you very much for your willingness to, to help the committee with its work. As I said before, I'm going to leave the record open in case some of my colleagues, in fairness to them, have, have questions further on on some of your comments. But uh, thank you very much for your willingness to help us today. Thank you. Have a good day now. Thank you. <clears throat>